I'm Sagar Das. I'm from uh, Rose Up TV, and we are doing this interview uh, for the children. Uh, so, sir, uh, <coughs> you born in Louvain, Belgium. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Louvain was uh, famous, is famous for uh, that Catholic uh, university. So, have you been there? मतलब you have been studied there? Yes. Um. मैं वहाँ मैं वहाँ विद्यार्थी था। I studied there, yes. Yes. So, sir, can you tell me something about Louvain and that before you came to Banaras as a student? Can you tell me about your young age, your school life, or about your study in that time? Yes, that's a lot to ask. Now, um, in my days, indeed, um, this uh, town of Leuven was uh, still uh, still a, a center of Catholicism, where a number of Catholic institutions were established, including, of course, first of all, of course, the Catholic University, uh, which was a a big intellectual center of the church worldwide, even. Um, and uh, there, I grew up in an entirely quiet neighborhood, totally uneventful, nothing to be said about it. You know, it was just, it was a bit boring, if you want, but I never aspired to anything else. You know, it was perfectly okay with me. Um, we uh, we went to church somewhere in the heart of the city, where uh, the the religion was still old-fashioned. You see, my father was totally against all the uh, novelties that were then appearing in the Catholic Church, okay. and so so you know he didn't want that. So we went to church somewhere in the city. Uh, where I was in the church choir. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, of course. Gloria in excelsis Deum. You know, or uh, what shall I say? Uh, Credo in unum Deum. Patrem omnipotentem. Factorem sceli etere. Visibilium omnium. Et invisibilium, something like that. Anyway, uh, I sang a lot better in those days than today because I had an operation. I can't properly hear myself, so I can't correct my own voice when I go wrong in singing. Anyway, uh, but th those were uh, interesting days. Um, anyway, um, so... You know, since you first ask about this general uh, ideological, uh, this religious atmosphere, um, that of course disappeared because you see the Catholic religion in Belgium has collapsed. There is that very little of it left. Already, no? the, when the uh, library burned. No, yeah, but I mean, that is a material event, you see. Then the enthusiasm was there to rebuild it. Okay. But uh, now, you see, churches are being taken down or are sold off to become restaurants or swimming pools or even mosques. Uh, and so that process of decline and collapse started when I was like 10, 12 years old. I remember, you see, many priests left the priesthood and um, often they got married. Catholic priests are not supposed to be married. Okay. okay. So uh, it, it, uh, that, that cozy world that I grew up in that disappeared. And so now it's gone. I mean, in my childhood, you saw priests on the streets all the time and nuns. And now they're, they're practically none anymore in my country. So that's a, that's a big difference. But uh, like the church where I, you know, where I grew up in, um, that is no longer a church. You see, that's now, I think, I think the swimming pool of a school, it's, it's at any rate, it's been bought up by the neighboring school. Okay. 
And um, so most of the things, the Catholic Church is not Catholic anymore, only in name. Um, the Catholic University definitely uh, has all kinds of teachers. Only Catholics are rare. Uh, <laughs> what to say? Yeah. It's like that. Anyway, huh. yeah. so that's that's sort of the the religious background of the world I grew up in. Yeah. So, did you find that uh, Banaras was quite e equivalent to that uh, your early childhood Louvain? Well, uh, it, there are similarities. <laughs> <laughs> I must say, except that Benares is much more alive in terms of uh, its religious commitment. There are all kinds of thriving uh, temples and religious events, festivals, you know, which in Leuven... Uh, I mean, first of all, of course, our people are uh, by far not as, as lively, as colorful as you Indians are. So it was already drab and dry to begin with. But you see, in though I still walked in processions, for example, as a child. Now that has gone, that has practically gone completely. And so you see, these religious events are completely alive over here. And in fact, I could tell you that that is perhaps one of the reasons uh, many Europeans come here. You see, they like this and it's not there anymore in Europe. Okay. And so, in a way, it's a dimension, dimension of life that is essential and that uh, Christianity can't provide anymore, whereas Hinduism can. So you think Hinduism is still providing peace to the mind and helping people yeah, to I come? Well, here at least, you see, I, I am not seeing uh, the whole of India, but at least in what I get to see, it is quite alive. In Banaras. Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> so later on, uh, you, uh, when you was young, you join uh, like, mot being motivated by Flemish nationalism, like, uh, and it was a l linguistic moment. It was a cultural moment. Well, no, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, you see, there was a specific uh, current of Flemish nationalism. Uh, to which we did not belong. And um, I mean, my father was a staunch Catholic, which means in the Belgian context that he, um, he felt for Flemish things, but he was not, not at all a militant because he thought religion and salvation, uh, moksha, is far more important than any national concerns. In fact, the whole discussion is quite um, quite acute in India too. You see, uh, there is a so-called Hindu nationalism that strongly swears by India and Bharat, uh, rather Bharat than India. And yeah, that that's okay, you know. I, I know where that comes from, you see. There was recently a freedom movement against the British and before that against the Mughals and so on. And so <coughs> the Indian people here still have strongly that nationalist inspiration. Now I must say in Europe that's, there's not much of it anymore because uh, we all know that all the borders between countries are recent, are artificial, are the result of armistice lines during wars or you know some feudal feudal arrangement uh, you know you marry my daughter but you get me this province of land and uh, happening in no but I mean those are the historical reasons why the borders yeah, exactly. are where they are yeah. and so <clears throat> so you know people it, it's not of much concern anymore uh, you know, people used to go to war over those things, and now that is so far away. And, and, and that's okay with me. You know, I don't think these things are very important. Uh, the borders around my country have changed so many times. And so, you know, I can't get worked up, up over it very, very much. Only 
you see, admittedly, some, some uh, arrangements of division of uh, power between countries uh, make more sense, are more efficient than others, do more justice to, for example, the linguistic diversity, that there are many languages and they could more or less be equated not with states, but with, you know, Pradesh, with provinces, in India. you know, both in Europe and in India. Yeah. You see, India made a very correct choice when, in the 1950s, it uh, opted for a separate state for the Andhra speaking, the Telugu speaking people, mm. and then the others follow the, the Punjabi, Suba, and so on. Language based provinces state. make perfect sense. Right. Uh, in fact, personally, I would go even farther. You know, like there is the southwestern corner of Karnataka, mm. they speak Tulu. Mm. Now, as far as I'm concerned, they can have a Tulu Pradesh uh, separate from Karnataka. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter much because it's all part of India anyway. And so similarly, in Europe, you know, all these countries are part of the European Union now. So if, if Spain, for example, remains united, or Catalonia, a province of Spain, separates and becomes a country of its own, it's not important anymore because they will all remain in the European Union. And so therefore, you see, I don't, I don't pay too much attention to it. But on the whole, yes, I think it is helpful is if Belgium is split into two halves, a Flemish half and a Walloon half, because they have distinct characteristics, they have a different economy, they speak a different language, and they don't know anything about each other. You know, who is the most famous uh, Walloon writer? Nobody in Flanders knows, and vice versa. And so it makes sense to, to give these separate cultures a separate country, or rather a separate province of the European Union. Because I see this in European perspective, just as in India you also see things in Indian perspective, in, um, you know, Akhil Bharatiya, uh, pan-Indian, mm. seeing the whole of India together, and then all these local problems you know, are minimized, are not so important anymore. Right. <clears throat> so then, uh, but yes, yeah, yeah. you wanted to know about my childhood? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so that was quite uneventful. I went to school. I lived in a happy family. Right. You see, I had good parents. I, they also stayed together. Uh, this is very important. I know because I myself, I am divorced even though we had four children. And I know that for the children, it's, uh, it's, it's no pleasure. You see, it's a very big disadvantage if your parents are divorced. But you see, that was not my case. I, um, I grew up in a very happy, close-knit family. And that's important, and I hope for your, yeah, the children over here that they um, can say the same thing. All right. So, uh, sir, uh, yeah. so the thing is, uh, so you have a very nice childhood with uh, spiritually living parents and spiritual surroundings and then you grow up, you join or you have a sympathy, you had a sympathy with Flemish nationalism movement mm -hmm. and then uh, you come to Banaras when you was 29. And why and how you came to know about Banaras and uh, how you came here? No, wait a minute, you skipped a few things. Yes. Um, well, when I grew up at age 14, 15, I left the church. Right. No, no, that's an important, important event. Now, that was not so difficult at that time because everybody was leaving the church. Mm. Maybe I was relatively early with that. I was the first in the family to do so. But uh, still, you see, religious attachment was not anymore what it used to be. I mean, you hear about situations of Muslims where one of the children leaves Islam, you know, or the daughter marries a non-Muslim or so, and you get honor killing and, and other, uh, you know, expressions of, of anger. That was not... You know, it, it was no big difference anymore. And anyway, soon after, you see, everybody left. When I was a child, everybody in class went to church. 
and today practically no one goes. So that was just just following suit, really. Um, but anyway, it, it's an important event because people did not want to believe in fairy tales anymore. You see, the idea that there was a, a Jesus who saved a soul from sin through his death on the cross and his resurrection, few people can believe that anymore. You see, about resurrection, well, we only have a story. Nobody saw him, you know, come alive again after death, after being dead. Some people say, of course, he wasn't really dead. Uh, that's what the, the Islamic version, for example, says. Um, now, but so the Catholic version was that, yes, he was dead, he rose from the dead, and thereby he saved us all from sin. Now, the level of sinfulness after Jesus' death and resurrection is not appreciably higher or lower than at any other time. And people before Jesus are just as sinful um, as people today, and vice versa. So nothing has appreciably changed in that respect. Uh, and so people before Jesus are supposed to all be sinners who badly need salvation, but you all, you have not converted to Christianity, what about you? Uh, so you are supposed to all be sinners, whereas I do not find much difference between you and me. Uh, so, so, you know, people are not inclined to believe that anymore. And in the past, okay, people clung to religion because they needed something to hold on to. But I grew up in an age of increasing prosperity and increasing knowledge the democratization of knowledge. You see, this was an age when we still remembered old people who were illiterate, who literally couldn't read and write. But there were still, there were very few of them and now they are non-existent. And um, so everybody went to school in my days, even higher education. You see, it, it was very cheap, the state paid for it. And so more or less everybody got some kind of education. And from that vantage point, it is hard to believe in these, well, relatively childish beliefs. And so that's why people uh, left the church massively. In Hinduism, the situation is very different. Of course, you have, you have funny beliefs here and there, okay? And there's room for that in Hinduism. And so there's a whole continuous landscape from these funny superstitions and you, you know, we have all these rituals that are not so empty. You know, people say there's empty ritual. No, 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 you can fill them with meaning. But okay, many people do them mechanically and so on. And then you get this philosophy and then you get this salvation or liberation, as you call it. And so in Hinduism, there is much more room for reason. You know, as a grown up, you can still call yourself a Hindu, even though you have left behind those superstitions. Uh, but you can still be a Hindu, that makes sense. So that's a different situation. In Europe, many people broke with religion completely and then nothing came in its stead. <coughs> Whereas in, in India, you can move, you know, through all kinds of different forms of Hinduism and remain a Hindu. Okay, but so anyway, that, that, was, that was not your question. Okay, so I left the church. Very, now... You see, when you, when you, no, when you empty your life gotcha. of your main system of giving sense to everything, something else comes in, in, in its place, usually. Now, at that time, um, leftism and extreme leftism was all the rage. So, you see, I, um, uh, I became a camp follower of that. You see, I was still, still too young to be very active in it, but uh, I read the little red book of Mao Zedong and things like that, you know. Um, but mainly, you see, when you're young, you're open to all kinds of influences. Like um, one influence, and here we come closer to Hinduism already. This was when I was about 19, I read a little book called, uh, I'll translate for you, 
um, principles and precepts for the return to evidence. For no, not not evidence in the English sense. No, no, l'évidence in French. How would you say that which is obviously true? Okay. okay? Return to that which is obvious. That, yeah. that that's it. And. Um, yeah, but not just truth. I mean, you, you can arrive at truth after a long and complicated search. No, no, here it is about truth that just jumps into your eye, that you can't miss. Okay. And um, so it was by Lanza del Vasto. He was uh, Italian. In fact, he was half Flemish, half Italian. And um, he was a follower of Mahatma Gandhi. And um, what struck me in the book was something that is not at all typically from, typical from Mahatma Gandhi, that is uh, just Hindu asceticism, that tradition. It said, against the cold and hunger, don't protect yourself. It means, when it's cold, do not put on warm clothes. When you're hungry, do not eat. Okay. Not when it does not automatically <laughs> cross your path. <laughs> so um, I took that seriously. Like uh, for a few years, I always wore sandals, even chapels, you know, even in winter. And, um, you know, on food I was very uneven, sometimes gluttonous, but sometimes I did fasting for a number of days. I remember once seven days fasting and um, I thought it had some merit, at any rate it was a good feeling, denying yourself something, you know, that which our very spoiled generation it hardly knew anymore. You see, we were a generation that was ever more prosperous. You see, after the Second World War in Europe there was a steadily increasing level of prosperity and which was more and more evenly distributed. So the formerly poor people also shared in the riches to some extent. So life became easier. And so at that time, in, in my country, we were the most prosperous generation ever. Now superseded by the next two generations that were even more prosperous. I mean, Nowadays they have a TV and, and smartphone and so on. That, of course, we didn't have. You know, we still went to, to school on foot or by bike, you exactly. see, whereas they get uh, carried by their mother on the backs, in the back seat of the car. Hmm? Um, but, uh, okay, so it was a very prosperous time. And so when I discovered asceticism, even though just bits and pieces of it, I, I liked it. <laughs> I found it exciting. Um, now, ultimately, you see, I was trying all kinds of things. Well, something negative I should also mention as something I tried, just to be more or less complete. Um, like many young people in my days, I guess today as well, uh, I tried drugs, marijuana, LSD, um, uh, but I gave it up very soon because, well, you see, most people I knew who were doing this were only doing it for fun, you know, like drinking to get drunk, and I didn't like it at all. Um, anyway, that's, that's not what we were doing it for. Me and a few friends, a few friends and me, hey, viewers, you got to be polite. You should not say me and a few friends. You should say a few friends and me. Okay. We were looking for the truth. And so we tried that, but the truth was not there. And so looking for the truth, I thought, well, maybe it's in India. Or well, I thought of other countries too, you know. Uh, I also studied Chinese philosophy. But, you see, I realized at some point that the best chance I had, perhaps, was in the... I started with the Upanishads. There was, a, there was an orange cover book 
by Hume. It's a well-known translation of the Upanishads. It's already a century old or so. Translation of the Upanishads. And uh, so they were all there. Barhadara, Yaka, Chandogya, and so on. And um, that was still as an amateur that I read those. Didn't know much of the background. But um, that, that, um, that was the turning point. Well, that certainly helped, yes. That was a turning point in the long term, let's say. Um, because I kept looking. For a while I gave up my studies. I did some odd jobs, all just enough to live because working didn't interest me. I told you I was looking for the truth. <laughs> I can understand. <laughs> and, um, but then ultimately I, I, I went to study. I studied uh, first, I, first I enrolled for Chinese studies, hmm. which I finished. I have a degree in that. Um, and then, um, yeah, that will be very helpful. But while studying Chinese, I. Sorry. Yeah. But um, while studying Chinese, I realized that perhaps more of the answer was to be found in India. And then I enrolled for Indian studies as well as for philosophy, because I was looking for the truth. Philosophy means uh, lover of uh, of wisdom. Yeah. And. Um, So, I don't know if the contents of a study course, of a university curriculum, brings you the truth all at once. But nevertheless, I had strongly the feeling that I was on the right track. This was where I had to be. So, between nine, you're ni 19 year old and yeah. 29. You, you have been studying where? Like, uh, well, this was all in Leuven. I've been yeah. in Leuven till I was, well, till I came here, till yeah. 29, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, uh, then you. Yeah. Sorry. So you came to Banaras after uh, your 29th uh, age. Uh, you came to Banaras in 1988. Uh, we have that information for Wikipedia. So uh, who? What was you what you was doing here in Banaras? Well, um, I wasn't planning on coming here. You see, I was interested in Indian philosophy, not in India. And in fact, I think that is still the case. Even though I have very much come to love India, and I know numerous uh, very uh, very interesting and very positive, uh, very beneficial Indians who have taught me the right things. Nevertheless, India as such doesn't interest me. I mean, if you are interested as a Westerner in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, probably never heard the name, but he's, he's one of the great philosophers in Europe. Now he lived in a city called uh, Königsberg. And um, w which is now in a, in a very uninteresting corner of Russia and nobody ever goes there. Now, even the greatest experts in the philosophy of Immanuel Kant usually have never gone to Königsberg, which is now called Kaliningrad in Russia. Yeah, they never go there. Why, why should they go there? They have his thoughts written in his books. And so similarly, you see, why should you go to any place in India? I've not, just now, two weeks ago, been to Kurukshetra, okay. where, um, where Krishna gave the sermon to Arjuna, which is now the Bhagavad Gita. Well, people all over the world study the Bhagavad Gita without ever going to Kurukshetra. Mm -hmm. You don't need Kurukshetra. Yeah. Though I must say that when going there, I was very struck by the energy of the place. My God, it's a really powerful place. You know, I advise everyone to go there. Well, not at once, not not all at once, but nevertheless, it is worth going. Um, but so me at that time, I was not interested in India. Uh, but um, just before um, I had married a certain crystal, and um, 
so uh, she had studied more or less something similar and uh, she got a scholarship for India. Now I rearranged all my plans so that I could come to India. Um, me too, I came to study on a scholarship. And um, so I must say that when coming to India, I liked it from the from day one. Um, though at the same time, I also had another typical experience. On the very first day I was here, I got ripped off badly. <laughs> How come? Well, no, no details. But, um, you know, that was also something that I had been warned for about India. Okay. Um, like, for instance, a, a, a shopkeeper we knew who was selling all kinds of gadgets, you know, uh, you know, interesting, meaningful objects from from all cultures in the world, from Peru and from Africa and uh, Australia and also from India. And he said, well, you see, uh, be careful with the, um, well, the deceit you risk in India. Because he said, my experience, my experience as a tradesman is that with traders from Peru and from Australia and everywhere, you can do business in a normal way. Whereas in India, when you meet someone who has interesting stuff to, to, uh, to sell, he thinks, ah, this is a Westerner coming. Now, now I can, you know, my, now my ship comes in, you see. And then they, well, they misbehave. They try to get as much as they can. And um, you see that the normal thing in, in business is you build a relationship with your customer so that next time he needs the type of things you have, he will come to you rather than to your competitor. And here, what he reported was that People just try to grab as much as they can, and then you know you you will you will remain with bad memories and not come back. But that doesn't matter. We don't think that far. We think of what we can win now. Now, that was India in those days. You see, th that was the image of India. I tell you, that was the image of India. And um, but you see, that's 30 years ago, and here economically, at least, India has changed a lot. And so I, I would not uh, give that kind of advice to people anymore. Right. Hmm. So uh, you were uh, when you were in uh, BHU, Banaras, yeah. uh, Banaras Hindu University, so what was the experience here, uh, the days uh, and the study life, the teachers, you, you can name some of them? Well, um, yes, uh, I remember a few. Like, um, like P.K. Agarwal, the son of V.S. Agarwal. Okay. V.S. Agarwal is a well-known historian who has written important books um, that are still useful, though he believed in the Aryan invasion theory, which is not correct. Indians did not come from outside, um, and he still believed. That was the old theory. Anyway, um, no, no, uh, or um, J. Antivari taught history here. Um, one person I remained quite close to until he died is the uh, philosopher um, Kedarnath Mishra. Uh, in fact, I dedicated one of my books to him, and I quoted him quite a few times. Um, so he taught philosophy, and we were more or less on the same wavelength. Um, which was unusual at the time. There was still a strong communist influence even here in BHU. You see, you did not have explicit communists, but you had many people who had like drunk in communist thinking. And so even though they didn't define themselves as communists at all, um, they still conveyed a lot of communist ideas. Or, or an explicit communist, Kashinath Singh. Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I hear he's still alive. Uh, in fact, I'm going to see him today. Right. <laughs> and I have, uh, you know, I didn't know him very well, except that I lived in his house for a few months. Well, we did. 
my wife and I did. Uh, because he was living on campus and he had bought a house for after his retirement outside, but he, he wanted people to live in that house, not to let it stand empty. And on the other hand, we needed a place to stay. So that was perfect. So we, we stayed in that house for a while. And um, he was a great defender of Hindi. Now, of course, I never learned proper good Hindi. In fact, here in Benares, I learned relatively good Hindi, but that's 30 years ago. And so in Delhi, you can perfectly get around in English. And uh, unfortunately, that's what I've done, except that I haven't been in India much since. But even in India, you know, I lose a lot of opportunity to speak good Hindi. And since you wanted my deep thoughts and my deep testimony, I thought, well, you see, in Hindi I can, like, explain explain road directions to people, you know, like, dusre uh, raste, bayan, and, you know, but to give subtle thoughts in Hindi, I'm sorry, this, I'm not good enough, okay? Anyway, oh yeah, 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 and that's someone, um, the person I learned Hindi from, is uh, Virendra Singh, that was private teaching. He lived on uh, Asigat, and I, I'm just here in town, I uh, don't know yet uh, much about how everybody is doing, so I don't know about him and his family. But he was a very fine man, that I know, and a good teacher. Unfortunately, I wasn't uh, with him long enough, uh, but uh, yeah, most of what I learned is from him. So, uh, during your uh, student life in Banaras, yeah. uh, uh, have you found uh, the same environment what you are finding nowadays? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> now, first of all, this was in the, in the humanities, in philosophy, and um, I can tell you, that the atmosphere in the humanities is very different from that in the sciences. Now you see I mostly meet people from the sciences. And um, there the mentality is just more, much firmer, uh, and especially in India. Because in the humanities, now here I'm going to say something that some people may not like to hear, but um, in those days, and I believe still to quite an extent, you see, in the humanities, you mostly find people, well, not qualified to do what their parents would like them to do, namely to become an engineer or a doctor. So, you know, they study history simply because, you know, they want to, they want to publish a marriage advertisement, you see, Agarwal girl, MA in history, you know? And... <laughs> Yeah, and <laughs> so, <laughs> but moreover, you see, what made it worse in those days is that it was always strike. Either the students were on strike or the professors were on strike. So, <laughs> you know, life was easy. Uh, but no matter, because there was plenty to do, even academically. You see, there were many conferences that were worth going to, even outside my own chosen field. You know, there was still, every every time there was something to learn. Then there were all these concerts on the riverside and, and so people on. Are all guru and, and many people to meet, also Westerners who were staying here, yeah. like, um, for instance, Mark Dichkowski. Right. He is the probably the man who made Kashmiri Shaivism famous. Kashmiri Shaivism is a Indian spiritual tradition that more or less died out, okay. mainly because Kashmir was conquered and so on, and you see not much of the Hindu tradition was left there. Um, and so he revived it. You see, he published all those texts, translated them and so on, and he gave a conference exactly when I arrived here, 1988. And that gave a boost to studies of Kashmir Shaivism. And now in the West, everybody swears by Kashmiri Shaivism. I mean, at least everyone who does yoga and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so that has become quite big. Uh, so that's, that's largely thanks to Mark Dichkowski. Also to um, uh, one more person than uh, Visuvalingam. He was um, 
also from that school also busy with the recovery of uh, of Kashmiri Shaivism. Then there was uh, Oscar Pujol. He was a student at the time of Sanskrit, very dedicated. And then already um, he was um, finding fault with the great dictionary by Monier Monier Williams that everybody uses, Sanskrit English dictionary. So he said, you see, there are many mistakes in it. And he found, he identified, he went through the whole book identified all the mistakes and made corrections. And then he said, you see, why not take this as a, as a start for uh, making my own dictionary? So he did. I mean, you're asking me whether I met anybody important. Well, yes. You see, his dictionary, Sanskrit, Catalan, a language that nobody knows, <laughs> is the best uh, Sanskrit translation dictionary in the world now. So I met the writer, you know, I, I knew him. I can say to my grandchildren, I knew the writer of the Sanskrit Catalan Dictionary. Yeah. Who else can say that, huh? Very few. Very yeah. Few, definitely. So, sir, <coughs> you went back to... Uh, okay. During this time, uh, you was uh, being affected by the communal state in India because that was the time when... Uh, the Babri happened, Mandir Vahi Banega. Do you feel that Mandir Vahi Banega? Uh, I'm still not sure. You see, everything points in that direction. That is clear, yes. Okay. But so, even then, even then, I'm not sure. Okay. So my actual question is, this time we actually uh, realizing that there is a problem in uh, Hinduism and mm -hmm. the Hindus in India yes. because uh, you write the de decolonizing the Indian mind, right? Uh, your paper, uh, which you published in uh, 1999. So it was the time you researched, uh, your research started here or you when you went back to Louvain? Okay, I'll tell you all about it. Yeah. First of all, my, um, my book is not called, is not called decolonizing the Indian mind. It is decolonizing the Hindu mind because, yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a difference. There's a big difference. Um, you see, obviously, these words have a different meaning. Definitely now, long ago, long ago, Hindu was simply the Persian word for Indian. And in those days, it was a synonym. Okay, but this is like 2,000 years ago. But then, you see, with the Muslim invasions, they took the word in Persia and when they came into India, they used it in a very specific sense. Namely, it means an Indian who is not a Muslim and also not a Christian or a Jew. So it means an Indian pagan, you know, someone who goes to hell. That's you. Me, I've been baptized in Christianity, the true faith. I'm going to heaven, whereas <laughs> you are going to hell. But then, but then you should be happy because what is hell? You see, there's, there's flames, you know. It's an eternal yajnya. It's an eternal agnihotra. So you should feel at home there. Absolutely. So I, I hope I go there too. Um, yeah. Um, so at any rate, Hindu means an Indian pagan. An Indian who is not a Muslim and so on. Uh, nowadays there are people who are saying, yeah, Hindu means Indian. No, that's not true. And you see, the Hindu mind needs decolonizing in the sense that um, Hinduism as such is still being depreciated, belittled. Uh, even in India, it is being exploited. Like, or according to the constitution, the state can simply nationalize, that is to say, take over temples from Hindus, but not mosques or churches. And so, like schools, they can they can make uh, they can force Hindu schools to take in non-paying pupils, mm. which is meant against poverty. And as such, that's a good thing. Only they can only do that to Hindu schools, not to Christian or Muslim schools. Mm. So effectively, effectively, Hinduism is still in need of decolonization. By contrast, India is not in need of decolonization. India has been decolonized. 
1947. And anything you can point to as lingering British influence is there only because you have chosen to keep it. Why am I speaking English? Okay, because you see in India, many, all the people who speak English, they behave just like me. You see, I speak Hindi with tea vendors and rickshawalas and cleaning ladies and so on. And as soon as it gets serious, I switch to English, okay? So with no basis in Hindi, that means I'm speaking only very, you know, very broken Hindi. And for you people, of course, you know Hindi, but nevertheless, Hindi is not being developed. Like P.K. Agarwal, I mentioned him, mm -hmm. the historian. He told me at the time, 30 years ago, you see, there are, in Hindi, every year, there are hundreds of words dying, being replaced with English words, as if Hindi isn't good enough, mm -hmm. simply because nobody uses them anymore. As soon as it is about science, about scholarship, people use English. Now, why is that? That's not because the ugly, vicious colonial British are forcing it on you. It is Indians themselves who have chosen to keep English as the official uh, language for higher education, for example. And so that should change. And if that is a disadvantage for me, well, so be it. You know, you don't have to care in your language policy about foreigners like me. You see, do the right thing for Indians. And so, you see, develop Hindi, develop Sanskrit as far as I'm concerned, but, you know, go native. Yeah. So, but that was only the start of your question. Yeah. So, please, please. So, 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 the start of my research. Now, the start of my research, I had come here to study philosophy, but at that time, I practically gave up on philosophy, okay? I had met a publisher in Delhi called Sitaram Goel, who was a historian, who was making a living as a publisher, but he was doing history and publishing important works for history. For example, Dharampal, Dharampal's book, The Beautiful Tree. Yeah. It's about native Indian education, how it, it gave everything you needed it was better than English education, mm. which the colonizers forced upon at least the elite in India. So, you know, he published important works useful for Hinduism. He wrote his own also. And uh, he wrote his book about Hindu Christian encounters. Now, as being from a Christian background and interested in Hinduism, this book interested me a great deal. So, I bought it, read it immediately at one stretch, and then the next day I went back to the bookseller to say that I had greatly appreciated the book, to buy some more books also. But then he told me, oh, but you know, if, if you think it's so good, you can meet the writer. The writer, he has an office just around the corner. Mm -hmm. And you know, he telephoned, he announced me, he said, you know, the guy was coming, arriving later that day. And so then I, was, I, I met him. And so then I got an introduction to the communal situation in India, right. to the situation of Hinduism, and that changed everything. And so, yeah, philosophy is interesting, of course, but, and I've returned to it greatly. Uh, you see, now I'm studying stuff like the uh, Sankhya in particular. I'm writing a book about Sankhya, uh, the history of yoga. That is a project more in the distance um, and so on. Now these things are far more interesting to me than the communal situation because the communal situation is all very simple but I had to discover it yet and um, so then you see I, um, I changed my interest uh, towards contemporary history and uh, I saw some strange things. You see in the West this is all uh, portrayed in a very simple manner, you know, on the one hand you have the ugly, stupid Hindu fundamentalists mm. and on the other hand you have the wise, enlightened and so on, modern uh, secularists and uh, that's it, you know and uh, then there was the Rushdie affair, Salman Rushdie had written this book, The Satanic Verses mm. and um, 
At the same time, Sayyid Shahabuddin, in the context of Ayodhya, had organized a march, a Muslim march on Ayodhya, which was going to coincide with some, some Hindu gathering in Ayodhya, and so that was sure to be a bloodbath. And so Rajiv Gandhi invited him, he was the prime minister at the time, invited him and said, you know, we want you to call off this march, uh, but, you know, maybe we can make you happy with some other goodies. And so he gave some demands, and one of them was you ban this newly published book, The Satanic Verses. And so that book was banned in India. And um, then there was a whole polemic in the press between the secularists. Not between secularists and, and, and others, you see, but the secularists themselves were in two minds about it. And so... About Mandir? No, no, about uh, satanic verses. Okay. Yes. So you had the, the hardliners, the, the communists, who said, you know, we should not make concessions to communalists like Sayyid Shahabuddin. You know, we should not give in on the, the, the access to this book. You know, there should be no book banning. And other, you know, the more mainstream secularists like Kushwant Singh at the time, like M.J. Akbar, mm -hmm. who is now minister or something in the BJP government. At that time, he was very much anti-BJP. Anti he was a congressman and pro-secularist. Well, nevertheless, they were for, they were in favor of the book banning. And uh, so I thought this was strange. You see, these are people who are against religious obscurantism, and yet they are in favor of uh, banning a book for religious reasons. So that's when I, I decided to study all this. Mm -hmm. So that then became my main focus for some years. And so that's how it goes in life. Uh, okay, yeah. This was... Uh, okay. Right. Uh, so, uh, this was a time you get accustomed with uh, Hindu nationalism, yeah. right, BJP, and the other thing is, uh, this was the time you start writing a new right uh, magazine. So, uh, yeah, but where, that doesn't, <laughs> I've written in all kinds, I've, I've started writing in a communist. No, no. Anyway, go on. Yeah, on. Uh, 1993, between 1993 and 1999, you have been writing in this new right magazine about Hindu tour and all other uh, issues. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know what sources you read, no. though I can name a few that are likely. Oh. But um, anyway, that is uh, that makes a connection where there is none. You see, I was in Belgium, and of course, you see, I was looking an outlet for my writing. And um, so I, I wrote, I, in fact, I reported on the whole Rushdie affair in detail, all kinds of things that nobody in, in Belgium knew about. And, um, well, very soon, um, that made me very controversial. Because um, when I started there was still a big uh, distance between Europe and India, also in this regard. You see this book banning for not offending Islam, that seemed to me a totally strange, abnormal thing, unthinkable in Europe. Maybe at that time it still was, but it was very fast changing. And so a few years later, I was vetoed, I was boycotted, uh, I was ostracized because of my views critical of Islam. And so, you see, mainstream papers refused to publish me any longer. So um, I took what I could get. And so there was this new right paper, which I thought was uh, very strange. You see, they were, um, among other things, very obsessed with the European past, which didn't interest me, at, like with World War II, mm -hmm. which didn't interest me. At that time, it inter didn't interest me at all. Later, that changed a little bit, um, because I saw it, its importance for Indian history. Uh, anyway, um, but 
you know, on many points I didn't agree with them. But then on some points I did. I mean, I appreciated the fact that they were going upstream, you see, against the grain. Um, that, of course, I had in common with them. And, and I mean, most of them had the heart in the right place, I would say. Uh, so I thought, well, you know, having been, having been ostracized anyway, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And, and I didn't particularly write about Hindutva there. They were not interested in Hindutva. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, more broadly, I would say people are not interested in India. You see, India is, a, is, is fair for, um, for exotic stories, for sensationalism, you know, if uh, something bizarre happens or if something ugly happens, you see. And there it ties in with the whole uh, dislike of Hinduism. You see, all the negative stereotypes of Hinduism, they are highlighted once in a while. Like when the Nirbhaya rape case took place. You see, that was front page news everywhere in the West. That was followed closely. Though not closely enough to really remark what is strange about it. Now, <laughs> if I have understood, uh, first of all, it was a very secular event. The, the, the six perpetrators were a good uh, representation of Indian society. Uh, but there was one minor among them, and that minor turned the rape case into a murder case. No, no, strange. Yes. You see, it, after these five other men had done their thing, you see, this, uh, this youngster decided to make it even worse, and, you know, he did some very ugly things that ultimately cost her her life. And... Um, so then for all the others, what had been a rape case changed into a murder case. So then they were having the death penalty over, hanging over them. Whereas the actual perpetrator who, who caused their death was a minor and therefore did not have this, this threat hanging over him. In fact, he was released. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a bizarre case. And here, you know, I don't want to judge it in communal terms or so. But from a journalistic you know, perspective, if I were a journalist, now that I would find a strange story. And if I were a filmmaker, now that I would find stuff to make a film about. Yeah. See? But so anyway, what I wanted to say is, not only is Hindutva fairly uninteresting to most people, uh, even to those who might be seen as political allies of it. You see, like now, you see, in Indian papers, there has been a lot written about the similarities between Donald Trump and Narendra Modi. Well, both won sensationally against the will of their own party. That, that is true. There is a similarity between them. Uh, but um, you see, those who said that should at the same time realize that while in India, Trump is being noticed, but not, he doesn't have a following or something, um, he has sympathizers, maybe, at best. But, I mean, at least they have to notice him. Whereas in America, nobody cares about what happens in India. You see, I mean, there are many people who, who say, yeah, India is still colonized, or, you know, everybody is against India, everybody has it in for India. The truth is, I'm sorry to say that nobody's interested in India. Mm -hmm. You see, if in the West they think of the rest of the world, they mean, on the one hand, the Muslim world as a source of trouble and China as an as a economic challenger. But India, yeah, it is interesting, you know, India is growing and so on, that's, that's fine, we notice that. But to really play ball with the superpowers, there's still, there's still some, some decades in the future. And so India is not, uh, not of, of that much concern. So, uh, what you are doing nowadays? Like you are... Oh, sorry, yeah. What you are doing nowadays? Your research and your work. Uh, yeah. Tell me about that. What I'm doing nowadays? Ah. Uh, uh, well, at the moment, I'm a visiting professor in the Indus University in Ahmedabad, or Karnavati, as they call it uh, locally. 
And um, well, my areas of interest uh, are still to some extent uh, contemporary politics and the cultural trends that go with it and that explain this politics to a large extent. Um, but then there is the uh, uh, an important, well, two important themes in ancient history. The growth of Buddhism, which the more you go into detail only proves, and here again many people are not going to like this, but proves that Buddha, Buddha was simply a Hindu. He was one of the many Hindu gurus. Although, of course, he has, you know, grown uh, out of uh, size, I mean, uh, has become a religion of its own in the sense there is so much of it and it has left India. It has become international. So in that sense, I mean, I wouldn't call Chinese Buddhism a branch of Hinduism. But uh, nevertheless, ultimately, it goes back to Hinduism. You know, you could call it Dharma. You know, Hinduism is a bit of a, a modern term, also a bit of a confused term. We can argue about its significance. Let's call it Dharma. You see, so in that sense, you see, Buddhism, even Chinese Buddhism, is Dharma. That, yes. That's one theme from ancient history. And the other, of course, is the Aryan invasion debate. Right. And about that, I dare say, um, uh, I have by now, uh, well, acquired the best knowledge that there is in the world. There are only a few people who are really up to date with the whole controversy. And so in the West, you have excellent linguists, far better than me, um, who know the inside out of uh, the linguistic aspect of the matter, but who don't know anything at all about the developments here in India. Uh, at one point, I was sitting in a congress of, in a conference of Indian archaeologists in Delhi, uh, two or three years ago. And uh, someone was speaking, I was sitting in the audience, uh, I was a little bit bored, and so I opened my laptop and I worked through my emails, and I had received an email from a famous Indian linguistics professor and an authority on the Aryan invasion debate. Now, he argued in this very mail that, uh, well, you know, uh, Everybody knows that is out of India theory, the idea that Sanskrit and, and, and all the other Indo-European languages, Russian and uh, English and so on, ultimately came from India. You know, we know that that can't be true and, you know. And so he was, he was talking from a very assured position that, oh, but we know that there was an Aryan invasion and so on. Now, at that very moment, the professor up there uh, behind the mic was saying, well, you see, at my site in Harappa, there is absolutely no trace of any Aryan invasion. It is total cultural continuity. And every other professor at that conference came to report the same thing from Lothal, from Raki Garhi, from all the Harappan sites, the same picture. And we find natural causes, we find desiccation, of the soil as a reason why people decided to emigrate from there. And, and so there was nothing of an Aryan invasion. And uh, I was sitting next to Bibi Lal. Bibi Lal is the only person of whom it has been claimed by the believers in the Aryan invasion theory that he has proven the Aryan invasion. Now the story is this. In the 50s, as a young beginning archeologist, right. He had worked on the painted gray ware. It's a specific type of pottery that appears at some point and that disappears at some point. And it coincides with the age when the Aryan invasion is supposed to have taken place. Now he had identified it with the Aryans invading India and moving deeper into India. That proof is, in fact, the first time I heard his name. You see, when I studied in Leuven, our professor, um, uh, Egermont, Pierre Egermont, a famous Indologist, taught us that uh, the Aryan invasion theory and that Bibi Lal had proven it. 
because of the painted gray wear. And then he explained the oath. Now at that time already, Bibilal had disowned this evidence. He said, yes, you see the painted gray wear is all as I said. You see, I described what I saw. This is all correct. But to link it with Aryans, actually I was only following the existing paradigm. You see, everybody believed in the Aryan invasions. And I can tell you, that's not what he said, but I can tell you, even leaders of the Hindu nationalist movement, like Veer Savarkar, like Bala Gangadhar Tilak, they believed in the Aryan invasion. It's not true that this is a, you know, that uh, out of India is a concoction by Hindu nationalists or something. No, no. Even Hindu nationalists in the beginning believed in the Aryan invasion. Everybody believed in it. V.S. Agarwal of this university believed in the Aryan invasion. He wrote excellent books about the Vedas, but assuming the Aryan invasion. It exists. Uh, but nevertheless, when forced to think about it, you see, or rethink his own findings, Bibilal said, but actually, I have only assumed the Aryan invasion. Actually, these data do not prove that any Aryans are involved. And so there is no proof of the Aryan invasion, even though till today, people quote Bibilal's finding of 60 years ago as proof of the Aryan invasion. Okay. But, but, but great defenders of the Aryan invasion theory like uh, Michael Witzel, admit in so many words that as yet, that's what they say, as yet, no material proof of the Aryan invasion has been found. Okay? So, so you, have, you have here people who know very well the Indian part of the evidence. And they know that it uh, militates against the theory of an Aryan invasion. And then you have linguists in Europe, in America, who know their part of the story, who know everything about the, the context between all the different languages in the Indo-European language family. They know all about the relations between languages in India and in Europe. But they don't know anything about the Indian part of the story. And so I am fortunate that I have a, a foot in both camps. And so... You see, I, I, am, I am left really alone to wonder, you see, to, to look at this, this strange contrast and to wonder, you see, how is this possible in an age of email and so on, when it is nothing to, 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 to find out how people think, you know, 5,000 miles from here, that still there is this, this dichotomy, you know, this, this mutual lack of understanding because of a mutual lack of knowledge. So what I'm working on now, in fact, is, is to bring those two together, those two p parts of the evidence. And in my opinion, uh, as far as I know so far, um, the evidence rather favors the out of India theory. Okay, but you wanted to know what I was working on. <laughs> so a little bit on contemporary politics more so on ancient history and then um, well there is still more about ancient history that's what I'm now turning to more and more is the history of yoga you see that is a very important subject uh, if only because yoga is very important I mean it is intrinsically very important uh, nobody teaches you liberation except yoga and um, because internationally it is becoming more and more important. You see, in uh, Europe, America and so on, more and more people are doing yoga, are studying yoga. The level of understanding of yoga is also increasing. More and more people have been in India, have taken training here. Uh, more and more gurus have gone to the West and have not just, you know, welcomed the big following and enjoyed it, uh, like the, the first ones, Maharishi, Mahesh, Yogi, and so on. Uh, but now are more aware of what is being done academically, are now uh, in, in Sanskrit studies and so on, are also more aware of what is being done in neuroscience. You see, there is a lot of scientific investigation into what exactly happens in the brain 
uh, or with the health state, with you know whatever, you know the skills they have and so on, of practicing yogis. And so you see, the the, the global level of yoga is is increasing, and in that sense, it is important to uh, get back to the roots of yoga, because in India, a problem is that while you have many genuine yogis, you have also well, not just false commercial, you know, guru babas, uh, but you have a r whole range in between. You know, you have many forms of spirituality that are genuine, but that also carry along some dead wood of silly superstitions. You know, and these two do not exclude each other. In a human being, they can perfectly coexist. I mean, look in America. You see among the Christian fundamentalists, you know, where you have these funny beliefs about the earth was created 6,000 years ago and, and so on. You know, yet, you see, this is what in, in, the, in their evening lecture they talk things like that. And then the next morning they go to work and they become surgeons in a first-class hospital. You know, or, you know, uh, scientists in the university doing, you know, objective hard science. Now, that coexists in the same person. You see these... These superstitions and this hard science coexist. That's that's what, how people are, and so in India you see the same thing. You know, you, you, like here in Manaras, plenty of it. You know, you see very, very bizarre form of religion, agoras. You know, sitting in 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 cremation grounds and so on, and 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 at the same time serious, um, systematic yoga. So. You see, that's worth working on, and I don't know if I'll find anything important. Uh, but uh, at any rate, I want to be part of that uh, that search that is going on at the moment. So, this Sri Kandavar Elts, our and in the books and write ups, you will provide a list. You will have a link to the link to the talks and videos. और आज के लिए इतना ही धन्यवाद